All right. Hi, guys. Welcome back. We're going to finish up chapter eight now. I am using a new software, so hopefully we won't have any more issue, issues with the videos coming out um, staticky. Um, so uh, before we get started, please make this change on your slides. Um, I removed the AIMS test from our uh, curriculum, and so we will only be focusing on replica plating for mutation um, for mutations. Okay, so a mutation is a change to genetic material, and this is a change that uh, does not get uh, corrected. Uh, so it stays in the DNA um, long enough to possibly interfere with the actual product of the gene. And um, mutations are usually either harmful or neutral and uh, very rarely they can be beneficial. And of course, we've talked about how in those rare instances when they are beneficial, they tend to be selected for uh, because they impart some benefit. Those organisms survive better, reproduce, and that it will become more plentiful in the population. So um, these uh, mutations are the natural way in which beneficial traits arise, um, but it takes a lot of uh, time for that to occur because uh, the beneficial mutations are the least often type, okay? So a, mut a mutagen is any anything that causes a mutation. So uh, sunlight is a mutagen, lots of different chemicals are mutagens. Spontaneous mutations, this can be due to an error, polymerase copying error, um, and also occasionally other, um, you know, reasons. Um, but the definition of spontaneous mutation means that it it was not caused by a mutagen. So it's not because of exposure to a chemical or a sunlight, for example. Okay. But remember, there's lots of reactions happening in the cell all the time. There's all sorts of molecules around. So it is possible for something to, you know, to happen within the cell. So we have specific examples of mutations that we need to know. And um, single base. So, uh, you know, on your nucleotide, you have your nitrogenous base, ATCG. Um, if just one of those gets changed in your DNA sequence, it's called a base substitution. Uh, so instead of an A, maybe you have a C or a G, right, or a T. And uh, so you didn't remove but you substituted, you put something else in its place. So that is a point mutation, which is a single uh, base substitution, okay? Um, if it results in a different amino acid, then we call it missense. Missense because it's still giving, uh, giving you a codon for an amino acid, but it is a different amino acid, okay? Uh, and then if it doesn't result in a change to the amino acid, but it results in a stock codon, we call it a nonsense mutation. So nonsense is a, one of those stock codons, okay? And a frame shift mutation is now a different scenario where you delete one or two bases, or you add one or two bases, and this causes what we call the reading frame, where you start counting every three base pairs to make a codon. Um, and so I have actually a very helpful video that we're going to watch that will demonstrate frame shift mutation. So again, inserting or deleting one or two nucleotides. Why not three? Three would put you right back into the same frame, reading frame. So it can only be one or two um, nucleotides that you add or delete uh, to get a frame shift mutation. Um, and this almost, almost always will give you um, different amino acids. So let's go ahead and take a look at that real quick.
a frame shift mutation is when an insertion or deletion causes a disruption in the reading frame. The reading frame describes how the nucleotides are broken up into sets of codons that are each three nucleotides long. Each codon codes for one amino acid in a protein. You can see in the original DNA strand that all of the codons are CAT, which codes for the amino acid histidine. But if a single nucleotide is deleted, the reading frame shifts, causing all of the codons to change. This results in incorrect amino acids being added to the protein. Once again, we start with the same original strand of DNA. We have the codons, CAT, which code for the amino acid histidine. This time, we will insert a single nucleotide, but you'll notice that this also shifts the reading frame, changing all of the subsequent codons and causing the incorrect amino acids to be placed into this protein as well. Whenever there is a disruption in the reading frame of a gene, whether it is caused by an insertion or a deletion, it is a frame shift mutation. Frame shift mutations can cause drastic changes to the amino acid sequence of a protein, disrupting the protein structure and its ability to function correctly. All right. So now that you're familiar with the types of mutations, let's go ahead and look at um, how they occur. Okay, so frequency. It's spontaneous mutations do occur naturally, um, and the primary mechanism is polymerase error, right? Copying error. Um, but that's actually not as common as you might think. So one in 10 to the nine, so a billion um, base pairs. Okay, think about the genome size uh, and so how, how often do you think these uh, base pair errors are actually being made? And then, um, of course, exposure to mutagens is going to greatly increase the mutation rate. The more exposure, the more uh, mutations uh, that you'll have. Okay, so all sorts of different chemicals can be mutagens. Um, not every single chemical is, but lots are. Okay, and then radiation is a huge source of mutagens. And so we have two types, ionizing and non-ionizing. And you already learned this back in chapter seven when we were looking at how to disinfect. And it, it's for the same reason, right? If we can cause enough mutations to bacteria um, or any microbe to kill it, then we have disinfected, right? And um, so it should, not, it should not be a surprise to you then that we can use uh, types of radiation to cause mutations. However, now we can also think about ourselves and how we want to protect ourselves from, um, you know, we don't wanna have too many mutations in our DNA um, over time that can lead to cancer, right? So, we do things like put on sunscreen and limit our exposure to UV light, right? Um, you would never be exposed to gamma rays, that'd be lethal. Um, but we do expose ourselves to x-rays when we need to, right? Diagnostic reasons. Um, and so, you know, when you go to the dentist or if, if for some reason you need an x-ray at the doctor's office, they cover you in lead so that only the region that needs the x-ray is exposed. And furthermore, over lots of, of years of practice with x-rays, we've learned how to control the um, exposure amount and reduce it to as low as, as we can um, because um, people who were working with x-rays um, early on were developing lots of cancers from this constant um, exposure. That was very sad because these people, researchers and physicians are devoting their lives to helping people and in the process they are hurt and injured from, from that. So thank goodness we know so much more now than we used to, right? Okay, so ionizing radiation is anything um, that can liberate an electron. So you have this um, atom, 
it gets struck by ionizing radiation and it causes this electron to fly out. Okay, and now you have an unpaired electron. So this is now a free radical. It's missing an electron in its outer shell. It is very reactive, it's unstable, and it is going to try to um, steal an electron uh, or donate this one to whatever it comes in contact with first. And DNA is a big polymer, right? Which is going to very readily, you know, react with free radical. And not only is it going to react, but it's that reaction is going to, going to get passed down throughout the DNA molecule. So it's going to happen over and over and over again, like dominoes to the, to the end of the DNA, um, unless uh, something else comes into contact with it along the way. So this is why we have things like um, certain vitamins that act as antioxidants. Um, and then of course we learned about the reactive oxygen species and having enzymes to um, help reduce free radicals or toxic oxygen species from forming um, as well. And so an antioxidant will actually say, hey, I can give you my extra electron or I can take on an extra electron and it neutralizes the free radical. Okay, so the number of, if the number of protons in the nucleus don't balance with the number of electrons, then it's going to be unstable. It's going to be a free radical and it's going to react with another molecule uh, whether that molecule wants to or not, right? And um, so then that molecule becomes a free radical and that repeats over and over and over again until you finally come in contact with an antioxidant. So you can see how this would um, cause lots of damage in, in a cell, right? Um, I posted a short video on um, free radicals last week. So you can go back to the module and check that out if you missed it or just to rewatch it. And so you might be saying, well, what exactly is the harm of this happening if, if the free radical passes all the way down the DNA molecule and eventually gets passed on to something else, then who cares, it, it left. Well, in the process, it can cause bonds to break and new bonds to form. And so an example with adenosine is that this group right here gets broken off and gets replaced with an oxygen. So now you have a double bonded oxygen, which is very different than this um, NH2 group, this amine group, right? So here with this um, double bonded oxygen, you're going to have a different interaction. And in fact, it shows that instead of the normal bonding with a thymine, A to T, you're now going to get um, hydrogen bonding with a cytosine. And that's the wrong base pair. And now, uh, now you have a mutation. Okay. The other thing that can happen when you expose yourself to sunlight is that you can get exposed to UV light. And UV light, if it strikes where there are two thymines right next to each other, it can make them have a covalent bond in between, right? So side side to side. We never in our in our DNA strand. Uh, we never have bonds between nitrogenous bases. So we should never have bonds this way. We only have hydrogen bonds, like orienting with this molecule here in this image. We only have hydrogen bonds forming between the strands, right? And uh, so where you see these uh, lines here in the image, that actually represents the hydrogen bonds. And uh, when the ultraviolet light strikes these two adjacent thymines, it can form that covalent bond between them. This changes the shape of that strand. And uh, typically that will um, be cut out and removed by an enzyme called photolyase. Photolyase is activated by sunlight. It's actually powered by sunlight as well. And it's really good at scanning the DNA and looking for any of these um, thymine dimers and removing them. And then that will signal uh, DNA polymerase to come in and fill in the gap. And then uh, DNA ligase will come and seal the last, the last of it together. 
but if you expose yourself to so much UV light, you have so many of these happening, it's possible that you won't be able to uh, take care of all of them. And you can end up with a, a mutation that doesn't get um, corrected. Okay, so UV light is non-ionizing radiation. It's not as high of an energy source, but it's still high enough energy source to cause those covalent bonds between adjacent thymines. Um, so we call that a thymine dimer. Um, it, typically any uh, two identical molecules covalently bonded to each other, um, we tend to call those dimers. And especially when we're talking about those nitrogenous bases, so you will probably see this again. And if you already took uh, physiology, you've probably already learned about a few um, cellular um, applications of dimers. Uh, so this is everything I have already said. So now um, the other type of DNA repair mechanism in the cell is what we call nucleotide ex ex excision repair. And this does not depend on sunlight, it's completely separate. And so this is scanning DNA for any areas where the methylation pattern is wrong and it will remove it. And then you'll get the replacement um, just like we saw with the DNA um, polymerase. Okay. And um, of course the limitation to these repair mechanisms is if both, well, for nucleotide excision, it's it needs to know what the correct bases are, right? So you remove the error from one strand and you use the opposite strand as the template to replace it. So if both sides have uh, mutations, then you won't have a template any longer and you won't be able to correct it. Okay, so here is a chart of different enzymes that we've learned about throughout the chapter. And I put notes next to the ones that you are not responsible for, uh, for knowing, okay? All right, um, mutant selection. So we can do experiments in the lab to look for mutants where they gain a function. And we can also do experiments where we look for them where they lose a function. I apologize for the noise. You might be hearing noise in this video because there's construction uh, right outside my window. Um, nothing I, I can do about that. All right, so um, positive selection, you're looking for a new function. Um, so you have a, a control plate and then you have um, other plates and you look to see, can it, um, it can grow on the control plate, can it also grow under these different conditions? And so you try growing it under different conditions and if it can, then you know that it gained that function. Um, for negative selection, you're actually doing the opposite. So you still have your control plate where it grows and you know it can grow, but then you introduce it to different uh, conditions where it should still be able to grow and the um, mutant will not be able to grow. So this is commonly the negative selection uh, we normally use a technique called replica plating. So replica plating, you have your master plate where everything can grow, okay? And then you stamp it and you, you take note of the orientation of the plate and the orientation of the stamper. Um, and then you stamp it onto other plates. And this other plate on the left is the same as the master plate. It contains histidine. And then the plate on the right uh, does not have histidine. And what you'll notice is everything can grow on the histidine and almost everything can grow without. And the only one that doesn't grow without histidine is the new uh, mutant that uh, you didn't know if any of these were mutants. You put it on the plate lacking histidine to see if any of them were and indeed where you no longer have a colony, but you used to have one um, on the histidine supplemented plate, that is a new mutant. Now, what they don't tell us in this uh, explanation is ha has there been a treatment that you um, did to try to induce a mutant? So the applications 
can be different for different labs. They might be testing chemicals or um, different types of exposures, or they might just be doing this um, over and over again until they finally get a mutant. Um, you might be trying to see what the natural mutation rate is of, of a certain type of um, species. You might, uh, you might just be looking for mutants to study the mutants more to get a better understanding. So there's lots of different applications as to why you might be doing a replica plate. Um, but uh, my goal in this class is just to teach you what the technique is. And so it's a negative screening technique for mutants. And so it's negative because you're, you're going to um, see which ones no longer can grow so they've had a loss of function. And then you go back to the either the master plate or the other control plate. And then you can pick that colony. You know that those are the uh, identical um, cells. They are the mutant cells uh, that didn't grow on this um, new um, type of media that doesn't have histidine. So in this case, you would be selecting uh, colony that has lost its ability to synthesize histidine. Um, but you would, depending on the species, genus species that you're working with, depending on your experiment, you would have different types of media. So it's not always histidine plus and histidine minus. Um, this is just what we used for the example. Okay. All right. So now we're going to talk about recombination and we'll talk a little bit about uh, some different mechanisms that lead to recombination. Okay, so uh, before we talk about uh, recombination, we, let's remind ourselves with the what vertical and horizontal means when we talk about genetics. So vertical gene transfer is the normal heredity right, of passing your genes from parent to offspring. So parent down to offspring, so vertical, right? Parent to offspring. Um, horizontal, on the other hand, is everything your peers, right? Passing genes from one bacteria to another is not even necessarily the same genus or species. Um, it's just your neighbor, it's sharing with your neighbors, okay? And typically we think of sharing um, horizontal gene transfer, we are, most common example is conjugation, which is how, using a sex pillus to transfer a copy of your plasmid over to another cell. And that's, um, we believe is the main mechanism of antibiotic um, resistance, the spread of antibiotic resistance. And, um, but there's also two other mechanisms that can um, lead to a horizontal gene transfer or recombination of, of the genes of a cell. Um, and so one of those is transformation, which we're going to look at a little bit today in this lecture. Um, and then transduction, which is using, um, it's when a bacteriophage uh, has like their first host and they accidentally take some DNA from that host. They go through the, the whole replication cycle. All of the new viruses have this piece of the host DNA and they go on to infect other cells and each of those cells now will gain that little piece of DNA that was um, accident from the first host. So those, those two cells, the two host cells never actually come in contact with each other. Um, they have the intermediate, the, the phage, the bacteriophage that is basically passing um, some DNA from one host to the next host. Please watch the video in the um, next week's module on um, horizontal gene transfer. I think it's called gene transfer in bacteria is what it's titled. And that will go over the mechanisms of conjugation, transformation, and trans transduction. That will be tested on exam three. So the specifics of the mechanisms are for exam three. For this exam, exam two, I want you to know this general information here and then what I'm about to go over with you, okay? So recombination just means a new um, sequence of DNA that neither um, 
So you have two molecules of DNA and you end up with a new combination or a new sequence that neither of those molecules had before. And the most common way that this uh, occurs is through what we call crossing over. Um, and so uh, you'll see what that looks like, but it's when uh, two chromosomes have a, a break and they can then overlap with each other and, um, and then swap places essentially. So you'll see what that looks like in a minute. So let's first start with transformation. So transformation, um, there's a famous experiment called Griffith's experiment. So he, Griffith and his lab of scientists did some um, experiments on mice and they took in their first set of experiments, they took uh, bacteria that are known to be pathogenic. They have capsules. It's a diplococci, as you can see. Um, and it's capsulated and they inject it into the mouse and it causes the mouse to die. And then they take a sample from the dead mouse and they culture it and it is exactly the same bacteria that they had injected into it. And so we know that that caused the mouse to die and that they are still encapsulated bacteria, pathogenic, okay? Then we do the same exact thing again, but now with those, those same genus of bacteria, but now it's a different species. It's a species that does not have the capsule. So this is a non-encapsulated bacteria injected into the mouse and the mouse is fine, remains healthy. You take a sample from the healthy mouse and you culture it and you do see a few of the um, bacteria that you injected, not very many, most of them have been killed they're not pathogenic. There's no infection. Um, eventually, you know, all of those bacteria will be removed from, from the mouse. And so we see that the bacteria without capsules are non-pathogenic and you're able to retrieve a few of them, okay? Um, phagocytes of the mouse are able to destroy them. Okay, then he took an, another uh, experiment where those pathogenic bacteria with the capsules are then heat killed. So he boiled the um, test tube over a flame for a little while and then put it into the syringe and you know let it cool off and then injected into the mouse and waited and the mouse remained healthy Furthermore, when you took a sample from the mouse, uh, the mouse didn't have any bacteria at all to be found. So all of the bacteria were killed and, and nothing grew in the mouse. And so then the last part of the experiment, and this is where things get very interesting, taking that same heat killed um, solution and adding in the non-pathogenic bacteria. So if I were you, um, I would make a note that, um, will this show up? Yeah, I would kind of show this being kind of broken up, right? Uh, these are, are not intact. They're, we're not injecting living bacteria. These are um, heat killed. Okay, heat killed. And then uh, those are being mixed in with actual living um, non-pathogenic, right? So these two here are intact and living, but they're the non-encapsulated bacteria that we saw here in, in part two, okay? And so we're taking part three and we're taking part two and we're mixing them up. So I would do the same thing over here that we just did um, over here. And I would show that these are um, heat killed, right? Okay. Just so that when you look at this, you don't get confused. Okay, so now mixing these heat killed encapsulated bacteria with living non-capsulated bacteria, injected that into the mouse, and after a few days, the mouse dies. 
why the only bacteria you gave it are non-pathogenic bacteria. T took a sample of the dead mouse and you're growing colonies of capsulated bacteria. These are the pathogens. So how did the non-pathogenic become pathogenic? So the first thing is to observe that that's indeed what happened. Non-pathogenic bacteria were transformed into pathogenic bacteria. And they did this by being exposed to naked DNA of the pathogenic dead bacteria. So what happens, these bacteria you heat killed, their guts spilled out into the solution, right? So their uh, DNA is just floating around in, in pieces and the living non-pathogenic bacteria took it in and probably was just going to use it as a nutrient source, but ended up insert, it ended up um, a recombination event ended up happening. And so we'll look at what that looks like uh, next. So from these experiments, they didn't know um, at first, they didn't know how, they didn't know the mechanism, but they saw that a transformation happened. Um, and so this was huge, right? To see that the living bacteria can take somehow the properties from the dead bacteria and, and, and become just like the dead bacteria. So we now know retros in retrospect, the process for that was a recombination of event. The genes that code for the capsule were taken up and used and, and then they became pathogenic. Okay, so how did that happen? So a small piece, the gene that codes for the capsule first was taken up into the non-pathogenic bacteria. And then you get this um, recombination of it where part of the uh, DNA from, from this molecule uh, binds to part of the chromosome of the cell and it ends up getting um, inserted and sealed in. And then whatever's left over just will get degraded and eaten as nutrients. Um, and so that's the recombination event. Um, this happens um, quite often in environment, right? Where cells die and other cells can take up the DNA that's just floating around them. And uh, if it becomes helpful, they're gonna keep it right and multiply and you'll have more and more um, with that trait. So this is what, this is the mechanism that happened in Griffith's experiment. Okay, we also have these weird molecules and um, we won't get to look at them in too much detail, but there are these um, genes that are called transposons that have the ability to, I, we call them jumping genes, right? They can um, put themselves into new places. And there's two mechanisms we call uh, replicative and non-replicative. And of course, with replicative, they make a copy of, of themselves and then insert the copy into any new spot um, along the DNA. Um, and if it's non-replicative, it just cuts itself out and puts it into a new spot. So we call this one like the cut and paste, whereas this one's the copy. So copy paste and cut and paste. Um, and so that's, that's pretty uh, fascinating, right? That uh, these changes in DNA can just happen. Um, so we've learned all these other mechanisms of how changes to DNA can happen, right? Mutations, transformation, transduction, conjugation, and now this is another mechanism, transposons. I've included a little video for you that shows what this uh, process looks like. You do not need to memorize the mechanism for transposons, just what uh, what's here on this slide. Okay, so lastly, putting it all together and thinking about evolution, which I've already been talking about, um, throughout, right? So organisms that have the best um, genes to survive are going to be the ones that reproduce the most. 
and then they'll become predominant in that population. And this process of the fittest, uh, survival of the fittest is a natural selection. So the ultimate source of this uh, genetic diversity is mutations and recombination events, right? Okay, which are all natural. Um, you can have unnatural mutagens like chemicals, right? But um, everything else we're seeing, uh, it's, these are all just natural phenomena. And that is it. Good job. Take a break, review everything, watch all those animation videos I've given you, and uh, you will do great next week on your exam. Bye.